This night's workshop is balancing work and home life. I didn't say family on purpose because I don't think there is any balance when it comes to your family. Family is family. And there is a great um, story or an example that was given by the CEO, former CEO of Coca-Cola. And he shared um, a commencement address at Georgia Tech back in 1991. And in that commencement address, he talked about glass balls and rubber balls or plastic balls. And he said that as, as a person, and I think this applies to mothers a lot, you're juggling all sorts of balls and you're juggling them constantly. And they're, they can't be, you can't hold on to one of them and just not do anything. They're just, they're always in movement. And, but some are glass and some are, are rubber. And the idea being that the glass ones, you cannot afford to let drop. The rubber ones, on the other hand, can drop. It's going to be okay. It's not the end of the world. And the glass balls are relationships and family. And those are the balls you never want to drop because they will shatter and it's hard to get those pieces back together. The rubber balls, on the other hand, could be work. It could be other assignments with church. It could be um, other uh, responsibilities with your neighborhood, PTA, things like that. Those are the rubber balls that if they drop, it's you don't want them to drop, but it's going to be okay. You can pick it back up. And somebody gave an example of another idea of, of lead balls, where if those drop, they don't shatter. They don't bounce. They're just more difficult to bring back up. And so that might be some, that could even be some relationships that it's going to take a little bit of work to get, get it back where it used to be. It's not broken. It's not shattered. But it's lead and so it's not quite where you want it to be. And so I think as mothers, we have to consider that when we're trying to balance our work and home life, there are just, sometimes you're gonna drop a ball, but you wanna make sure you don't drop the most important balls of your family experiences. So that was um, Brian Dyson who gave that example. Um, the reality um, is there are gonna be always some challenges with managing this. And we're gonna be going through these um, challenges, understanding those challenges, some of the strategies uh, for effective time management, set, setting boundaries, and then building a support network. And we're going to spend the most time on um, effective time management just because I think that that is critical for all of us, even if you're not a, a mom returning to the workforce. And I think a lot of people can benefit. Um, I always like to share this slide just to give an example or give some background of, of who I am. Um, the reason why I love teaching these workshops is because I had to return the workforce 10 years ago when my husband filed for divorce. And we had been married almost 25 years and I hadn't been in the workforce for almost 20. So that was a really long time and it was scary and hard. And I wanted to share this picture of my family because this is a picture that was taken just a couple of months before I returned to the workforce 10 years ago. And this is my family. Um, my divorce was almost final. And this just shows you where I've come from. So this was me just being a stay at home mom. Uh, and when I say just, you know, we as mothers are super busy. We're working all the time. We're just not getting paid for it. And so I was managing these wonderful children, enjoying them, and then all of a sudden I had to return to work and it was so scary and so hard and I didn't have anybody to show me the way. And I, had, I knew other people that were, were working, working moms, but they didn't have the trauma of having to return suddenly to the workforce to provide for their family. And so I was reflecting on this over time and I thought, I really want to be able to help other moms figure out how to return to the workforce. And those could be moms that are either doing a career pivot, so they're already in the workforce and they just are trying to figure out something different that they want to do, or they could be starting from scratch just like I did, where you don't have very much experience and you are starting after a large career break. And then there's also mothers who intended to go back to work always, and it's just been so long that they don't know, you know, they're, they're not sure what they like, they're not sure you know, they're just trying to find fulfillment. They're figuring out themselves still. And so I want to be able to provide some of those tools and some tips that were very valuable to me that I want to just share. So that's what I'm here to do tonight. So um, some of the challenges that we as moms really have to struggle with, and it's not just the challenge of returning to the workforce, but it's 
primarily mom guilt. Like mom guilt, I don't know about you guys, but even when I feel like I'm doing everything right, I have a huge amount of mom guilt. And I think mom guilt isn't a bad thing necessarily because it forces us to give from our heart and give the best of us. And um, but it does cause us to have a lot of a lot of pressure and stress and anxiety. And I know I feel it all the time, even though my youngest is now um, out of the house and I'm an empty nester this year. Um, it's very, it's, it's weird to feel mom guilt still, even when they're all out of the house, because I'm thinking I should be doing more. I should be, should be doing other things. Um, time management is probably the most significant challenge of returning to the workforce because you have little time as it is when you are a stay-at-home mom because you're giving to all of your children and your, your husband if you're married. And then when you return to the workforce, you still have a lot of those same responsibilities and you're putting work on top of it. So where is the extra time going to come from? There, it's not like somebody says, well, now you're a working mom, so here's extra five hours to your day because we know you need it. That, that's not how it works. And so just managing time is really challenging. And then lastly, the feeling of just being overwhelmed. I think just being a mom, a stay-at-home mom, is overwhelming. Um, there's so many responsibilities, having to drive your kids places, having to meet expectations, having food on the table, um, you know, making sure you have a strong relationship with your spouse. Those are all the things that have to happen all the time, and that can be overwhelming regardless of whether you are actually working um, outside of the home. And so the feeling of being overwhelmed is, is going to there's going to be more of it and you're going to just have to figure out a way to manage the, those feelings and we're not going to talk as much about that because over time it gets better so you know when i started work as a newly divorced mom um i felt huge amounts of of being overwhelmed not feeling like i was doing anything well i wasn't there for my children i wasn't able to bake brownies for them after school we were having frozen meals for dinner there was just I just felt so inadequate and um, really felt like my family was suffering. And that feeling of being overwhelmed was really strong. And over time, it has dissipated. And as my kids have gotten older and as I've figured out different time management skills and how to prioritize things, it gets better. Um, but you are going to just feel overwhelmed because that's the nature of starting anything new, whether it's starting a new job or a hobby, anything that is not in your normal work day or your your day-to-day um, -day life is going to feel very overwhelming. So that's just something you're going to have to, to deal with. So those are the challenges. And so let's talk um, about some of the strategies of effective time management. So the, this is the area where I think I want to spend the most time. And it's simply because if you can manage your time, it can make everything feel so much less over overwhelming. It feels so much better. So the first thing I like to suggest is to plan and prepare. And I have to admit, I'm not the best at planning and preparing. I have good intentions, but I'm not the best. I have friends who will make all of their meals on Sunday and freeze it and, and put them in Ziploc bags and they cut up all the vegetables and they plan out their menu for the week. That's not me. I have tried. I'm not successful at it. But if you're successful at it and it works, you should do it. The best time to get all prepared is the Sunday or the Saturday before the next week. And so if you can get as much done that, you know, makes sense for you, then I recommend that you go ahead and do that. Um, you know, making sure that you have all of your children's activities all planned, have that all scheduled, making sure you go through the calendar that at the beginning of the week, you know, if you're married, going through it with your spouse and saying, hey, who's going to do what? And making sure that you both are aware of what's going on. Everybody has different um, ways of managing their life. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in, in a minute, but I just want to show you what I ended up resorting to. So I've tried digital. I've tried everything. I used a Franklin planner when I was in college and it worked great. Um, I tried that again. And every different tools work for different times in your life. And so this particular, um, this is just a binder that I have you know, bought. And it has a sleeve for the, the top, which I like because I can put in you know, a picture or a reminder or something that I'm working on, I can put it there. But I have all these tabs, and these are the tabs that mean something to me. And so you could do something similar where you've got different areas of your life. Um, I have a section where it's just like my morning, and this is my morning that I'm going to be, you know, so these are the things I'm going to be getting done in my morning. This is my routine that I have. I take notes if I've got different things that I've got to do. 
I also have um, the calendar. So I ended up putting everything on a big calendar and just putting it in these sleeves because that's what works for me. I tried the smaller calendars. It just didn't feel like I could see it. And sometimes I'll color code the, the boxes so that I know what is going on in each day. So if it happens to be I'm out of town, that might be in purple. And if I have a, a meeting that's for my passion project, like for tonight, it would be maybe in red, it's different colors. And then I um, put all of my past calendars at the, in the front of my um, binder so I can refer back to it. So you can see some of that color coding right there. And, and so I keep that so I don't, don't throw it away. I'll keep it for the entire year. And then, because I can refer back to it, but then every, every month has a, different, has a different calendar. And then some of them are, are front and back. And I can just plan my trips and have everything there. And so I have an entire year set up this way. That's what works for me. I also have a separate, um, uh, I, I guess like a clipboard with a sheet that says to do, and it just has um, lines and boxes. And I just, I'm a big person and I love to-do lists. Like I put on the, I'm one of those that puts the thing on the to-do list that I do every single day, no matter what, because it feels so good to check it off. It could be as simple as make my bed, something like that. I know I'm gonna make my bed every single day. It's on the list, it feels so good, I accomplish it. Do what works for you. I've tried the digital, I've tried the different things. It just never, worked and i think you have to maybe try a bunch of different things till you find out what works for you so if you're if you're old school like i am you like paper you like i like to feel it i like to have it very i'm tactile i like to make notes and i like to do do that as my that's the way i manage it but if you're on your phone a lot and digital is what works for you there's tons of great apps and we'll talk about that in just a minute um, but making sure that you're planning and preparing before the week even starts. So I will go through my binder. I also have my goals in there too that I want long-term, short-term, all those things. So I have what I need to do that week so I can refer to it and it's all in my binder. The disadvantage of having something like that is that when I travel, I can't just bring my big binder with me. It's not, it's not great. So I have, yeah, I have tried the smaller ones so that I can travel, but it doesn't work for me. So um, that, I just keep resorting to the big, big binder and I, I love it. Um, some of the digital planners and tools that exist are Google Calendar, which if you're already in the workforce and you're using that for, for work or even Microsoft Outlook, those are calendars that you can put everything in. This is going to sound silly, but I have things digital for work and I have paper, tactile, whatever for my personal life. I don't, I can't seem to find a way to blend them together. And so when somebody says, can you do something that's during the work day, I have to look at my phone. Um, because I'll, most of my schedule is um, on my calendar for my work, on my phone, and then anything outside of that, I will go to my big um, binder calendar. And that, again, that works for me. And I used to be embarrassed about it because I felt like, oh, I'm so old school. I should get with it. I should have some digital tools. But now I'm not. I'm just, I'm owning it, and I love it, and it works for me. Um, there are a lot of task management apps that are out there now that I um, have tried, but they don't work for me. Um, Todoist is an app that a lot of people like, and you can manage daily tasks and to-dos. And because I like to physically cross it off, that doesn't work for me, but there's a very, it's a very similar um, program. Um, there's Trello and Asana. They have, that's great for project management and team collaboration. And so that's a way that if you are working with a team, that that'll help keep you really organized. Um, something else that a lot of people like to do is time blocking, where you block off a certain amount of time each day so you can make sure you get something done. So something I really think is a great idea is if, if you know you have to do something, put it on your calendar as a task that you've got to do that day during a certain hour. Because if you don't make time for it, it's too easy for everything to happen, especially if you have kids at home they're going to they're going to take the time um, because they're your your priority and so i think it's very important if you know you've got to do something to block off that time there's an app that's called clockify i've never tried it but it tracks how much time you are spending on tasks and it's really good for time blocking so if you again if you like the digital tools that's something to consider um, note taking apps so i realized um, early on in my life that i don't have a great memory and so I have to write down 
everything. You guys are going to laugh at this, but I used to have a binder just like this. It happened to be black. And I would put in the binder when my children had a consequence because I would forget what the consequence was, why I had given it to them. And they would want to, to go out and play with their friends. And I would think to myself, wait, I think you have, a, I think you're grounded. <laughs> and I go back to my binder and sure enough, yep, so-and-so they're grounded. And I, they were grounded for two days, you know, or whatever, no playing with friends. But if I did not have that written down, I seriously, my kids would take total advantage of me <laughs> because I just, I just, I just would forget. So um, I think that's really important to, you know, keep track of, of the conversations, anything you think you're going to forget, write it down in notes. So I have lots of note paper in my binder that I can use. I also have for meetings, I have a thinner black notebook that I like to use because I feel like that makes it more professional. So this, again, I have my work life and my home life are very, very separate. And I do that kind of purposely, but um, it means that when I travel, I have to bring my black notebook and, and sometimes I bring my big white binder, but it's that's just what works for me. Um, but I do, I take notes. And so I'm a handwriting note kind of person and I like to you know, just always have it in binder and write the date and write stars next to the things that are really important for my notes. But there's a lot of really great apps out there. So there is Evernote that helps you um, take down notes and also keeps tasks organized. Um, it has um, like personal and work-related information that helps you um, have that. And then OneNote is a digital notebook and I actually do love OneNote. I use OneNote um, for all of my like when I'm just capturing lots of journal entries and things like that, I, I have a physical journal, but for my passion project, I put everything in this, um, in OneNote and it allows me just to capture everything and then I have different pages and it's really organized and I really love it because it's in the cloud, which means no matter what computer I'm on, I can access it. So if I'm on my home computer or my work computer, I can access it and it kind of comes with me wherever I am. Um, you can also have audio commentaries, drawings, and screen clippings and things like that that we also can capture, which I don't use. Um, when I got divorced, I was, um, it was really hard to combine our calendars. We, you know, my former husband had his life now, and then I had my life, and it was very challenging. And so he came across an app that's called Cozy, C-O-Z-I. And it was a great tool that anybody can use, but we happened to use it because we were divorced and you can organize your, your activities and your kids' activities. And so everything would go into that app and it doesn't cost a lot of money and it's a great way to keep everybody organized and you can put like which child has their activity. So it might be a sports activity. I would put all those, the games, the location, everything was in that so that then he and I didn't have to communicate because when we were first divorced, we didn't want to, I, I didn't want to talk to him. Um, now it's great. We communicate. Everything's fine. But that app saved us. But you can use it even if you're not divorced, and it's great. Um, it has shopping lists uh, along with this calendar, a, a to-do list, and things like that. I only used it for the calendar because that's what I needed it for. Um, there is also an opportunity to be able to have a a family wall where you can um, have a shared space to manage your schedules. You can use it to organize things. You can put, like you have a bulletin board and, and put different notes and things like that. I have a um, also a big calendar, um, wipe off calendar that's on the wall of our kitchen so that all of my kids can access that and make you know, changes. Because when when you're dealing with young kids, they're not going to look at a cozy app. <laughs> they they need to see something physical. So if they and when my kids were young, I color coded each of the kids according to their color. So they could look at it and be like, even if they didn't know how to read, they could look at that day. And if they were orange, they could say, "Mom, what am what is on my calendar for today?" And they would oftentimes look at that. So I think having different, um, you know, and some people would say, "Don't have all these different options. Have just one." But Again, use what works for you. And for me, it worked to do the way that I did it. Maybe not as efficient, but that's, that's how I did. Um, there are also lots of great books on productivity and blogs that I wish had existed when I was um, a new, newly returning to the workforce mom. Um, one of the books that I really, really love, it's called Getting Things Done by David Allen. And that is a great book because what it does is it suggests that you make a list of all the things you've got to do in your 
um, life and you put it in, you, you organize it according to the place where you're going to get it done. So I might have, again, in my notebook, a bunch of different things I've got to do on the computer and I would organize that list based on the computer because I'm going to get it done while I'm on my computer. I'd also have a bunch of things and put it with phone. They're going to get done through the phone. And then another list that's done by the car. So errands, things like that. So that's, that is another great way. So I've done that for many years. And every now and then I go back to just my regular list, but it, it does work really well because when, especially when I'm in the car, I can look at that list and be like, oh yeah, I've got to go to the dry cleaner. I've got to pick up the prescription. I've got to go to the doctors. I've got to do, and those, it's just organized according to where you're going to get it done. And certainly if there were things in the home that you were going to get done, you would have home and it would be, you know, organize the pantry, put away the groceries, whatever it happens to be. So that book itself has lots of really great concepts. So that's one, one suggestion. Also, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. That has proven time-tested strategies that can be really effective. And it's for effective for anyone. You don't have to be a mom returning to the workforce. But those are two books that I would really um, recommend, at least as you know, a tool to be able to get yourself organized. So we're going to talk about prioritizing tasks next. And um, this is something that I think could be very helpful to you, or at least conceptualizing how do you prioritize tasks. So there's this matrix um, called the Eisenhower matrix. And it was developed by President Eisenhower when he was the president. And he um, developed this because obviously he was managing lots of different things. He was the 34th president of the United States, and he had he was dealing with all of these um, government issues, and he used this um, format to prioritize his tasks. And it's divided into four categories, and this is how I've organized it. And the um, urgency is at the bottom, so from low to high urgency, and then the importance from low to high importance. And so in this square, so first of all, you make your to-do list. You put all the things you've got to do on your to-do list. Again, this is just another way to organize your life if you didn't want to do it, like the getting things done way, et cetera. So everything on your to-do list is there. And then you would put it into these different quadrants. So this one is schedule because it's high importance, but it doesn't have the urgency that some other tasks do. So it's important, but not so urgent tasks that can be scheduled. So those are things that don't have to be done right now, but you know you've got to get it done. And it would be good to have it scheduled so you know when you're going to get it done, but it doesn't have to get done right away. So some of those things could be you know, relationship building, exercise, self-improvement, things like that, that if you didn't do it that day, it's okay, but you want it, but it's important. So that's again, it's high importance, but not, not high urgency, okay, from a time perspective, right? So do first are those tasks that you want to focus first on the important task. This is like a super important task. Again, high importance, right? That has to be done today. So the urgency is also high. So this area is where you're going to focus for all of those tasks that have to be done that day. Some of those things could be, you know, pressing problems, deadlines, things that are going to have to get done that day. Maybe it's taking your child to the doctor, whatever it is. That is, you know, that has to be done, all right? Um, this is a don't do. So it's neither urgent nor important. Again, low importance, right? Low urgency. And those are the things you're not going to do. You're not going to just mindlessly, you know, search the internet. You're not going to answer certain emails. You're not going to do some wasted things that might be fun, but aren't really super important to do. You're not gonna, you're just not gonna do it because it's not important or urgent, okay? Then delegate are urgent, less important, but you can delegate them to others. So these might be emails, phone calls, some meetings that you could also delegate. Um, and, and then, but there's often going to be a lot of interruptions and this is, really great if you're working right now and you want to make sure that you are making the most of your time because if we could be better delegators we could be much more efficient and we're going to talk about this a little bit more when it comes to our family how do you delegate within your your family because they're you know they're very important you've got to get them done it's urgent but somebody else could get it done you don't have to get it all done 
So we talked about um, some of the to-do lists. Um, there's also an ABCD method, which is another way to be able to stay organized. So you base it on priority and urgency. So A tasks would be, you know, the urgent priority down to D, where D would be less. And so you make your to-do list and you put A, B, C, D on each of those and you'd make sure you're getting the A tasks done every day. Because again, those are the ones that have to be done. Those are the to-do, it must be done. And then the other ones can you know, fall in. So it's a very similar idea, but it's A, B, C, D. And another one is just, um, like I told you before about the time blocking, making sure you put high priority tasks on the calendar and make time for it, right? Not just, oh, well, it's gotta get done today, but I'm not sure when, but I'll get it done. Um, you need to make sure you, you block it on your calendar. Um, there are lots of online courses and workshops that can give you some tips and tools to be able to become more productive. Um, Coursera has some really great ones. Udemy, LinkedIn Learning also has some courses that you can take advantage of um, that help you with time management, work-life balance, things like that. So if you just do a search in Google, you'll be able to find those and they can be really helpful. Um, there are meditation and, and mindfulness apps that again, if you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed, you can go to those apps to be able to get some help and some relief. Um, there's an app called Headspace and Calm. Those also relieve stress and they can improve your focus. I've never used those two, but I have a friend that has and she says that they're very helpful. So Headspace and Calm. I'm not sure what they cost, but those are two you could consider. Another area that we don't always think about is um, how do we um, also take advantage of the network, the mom network that are available to us. How do we take advantage of those moms that are already in our network that could be really helpful to us? Maybe they've got some great ideas. There's a lot of online communities that can be super helpful to us that we should take advantage of. So if you go into Facebook and, and you search up mom groups, stay-at-home moms, moms returning to the workforce, any of those things, you'll be able to find lots of different groups that can give you those resources. There's also ones that have to do with, um, you know, the LDS church and things like that. So if you have an interest in that, um, definitely take advantage. So we are going to go next to um, setting boundaries. And this is probably really difficult for a lot of us because if you're like me, you're a people pleaser. A lot of moms are people pleasers because you wanna make everybody happy because you know if everybody's happy, then you can be happy and you don't have to feel as stressed. But we're not really great at setting, setting boundaries. I know I'm not and so I've had to learn. This is a learned skill. <laughs> so here are some of the things that I recommend we're going to go through. Clear communication. One of the biggest challenges when you return to the workforce is you have to communicate what the new normal is going to be, especially with your children because they've been used to having you around. So if you're going to be going back to work either part-time or full-time, there are going to be some things that you're not going to be able to do anymore. And so making sure that you communicate this is what you're gonna have, this is what's gonna happen. When I had to return to the workforce with my children, I sat them down, I said, this, these are the hours I'm gonna now be working. I'm not gonna be able to take your lunch to you at school if you forget it, so don't, <laughs> you know? I'll be able to take you to school in the morning, which I loved because it gave us a chance to be together, drop them off at school, and then went to work. So let them know that you have, that there, there's a plan, that you have boundaries, that there are different things, that set those expectations. Um, make sure you let them know your availability, work hours, when you're gonna have meetings, especially if you're working from home. That's really important to let them know, listen, I'm working right now. Mom cannot be answering your questions. You're gonna have to ask a sibling. Or if dad happens to be working from home and he has more flexibility, then make sure that they know that they, you can go to dad and ask him questions, but mom is working during this time. And that's sometimes really challenging. But oftentimes um, companies um, I know and organizations that you might get hired by are flexible for moms. Like for example, I have a mom that works for me and she has two young children. Her mother comes and she takes care of the children during the day when they're not at school. And, but there are times when she's needed and I get it because I am a mom too. So she'll just let me know and just, just give me a message hey, I've got to step away for this amount of time. Is that okay? And I'm like, yep, because I know she'll get the work done. So I'm not worried. She just has to work more efficiently during another time of the day or another day of the week. 
And, um, but, but that's just sometimes what happens with moms. And so you have to have that flexibility so you can let your children know that there's some flexibility, but when there really are strict boundaries, you've got to communicate it, and especially to your spouse too, so that they understand that this is time. So especially if they, I used to get my kids like sending me texts and, and calling me and things like that, and I would be in meetings and it would be interruptive, even if I wasn't answering it, it just kind of distracted me and pulled me out of my thoughts. So just let them know, hey, unless it's an emergency, unless you can't get any help, like this, you need to not, you know, interrupt me. And give them resources and tools and other things that, you know, go to so-and-so if you, if you need me. Or send me an email if you need me. Don't, don't try to call me. And that's way, that's possible too. Because sometimes I can check, like I'll be on a, on a call, a Zoom call, and I can check my email. I can do those kind of things. Sometimes it's um, just as easy as checking your phone. Um, so we talked about def uh, you know, establishing your, your work hours, making sure that if you have some flexibility in your schedule, you also have some fixed time too. So you make sure that these, this is the hour that I cannot be bothered. I try to schedule my meetings in the morning and have the afternoon be for dedicated focused work. So if I was to be interrupted, the afternoon is the best time for my kids. So I let them know, don't, don't call me during the morning. If you really need me, just please let me know in the afternoon. Learning to say no. Hey, this is another one that's really hard for moms. I know it's hard for me, so it's got to be hard for at least one of you there. So recognizing you cannot do everything. Saying no is not showing weakness. It's being smart. And so there are times when you are definitely going to have to say yes because it's your responsibility with work and maybe you have some commitments, but there are times when you can say no. If someone asks you, hey, so-and-so is having a baby shower. Can you help me? you know, bring some, you know, of the refreshments. Guess what? When you work, you probably aren't going to be able to do that anymore. And it's going to be hard at first because you're used to always saying, sure, I'd be happy because you're a helpful kind of person. But all of a sudden now you're going to have to say, no, you're going to have to turn down, um, you know, like the lunches with your girlfriends and things like that. That was hard for me at first because I liked the social interaction and I had to give that up because I was working full time. So, just, you know, you just say no very kindly and assure them that you would love to, but you, but you can't. And this is definitely say no is definitely a skill that is, um, is an acquired skill, but you need it to be able to maintain, maintain work-life balance and having your family still love you. <laughs> um, use technology wisely. So try to set up your phone so you're not getting messages during the evening, like for work. Right? So in other words, if you have a work schedule that you know that you're going to be working from, is it eight to five, nine to six, whatever it may be, once you're out of those hours, unless it's an emergency, you, you should really just not be on your phone checking messages. Because what I discovered is if you have a boss that does ping you during the evening um, or a manager that's texting you and asking you questions, if you respond, they will get used to that. They will expect that that's what you're going to do because it's great to be the manager because I've been the manager um, and it's great to be able to get responses right away, especially if I have a question and I want to get it answered immediately. It's great to get an answer, but you need to set those boundaries to let your manager know that from you're, you're happy to be there during the work hours, but once you're out of that, then unless it's an emergency, and they may also think emergency is um, different from your emergency, and you may have to say this what is what is an emergency, right? Um, and that that is something that's challenging too, is making sure you're not using your technology to um, keep you tethered to work. And and I work from home, so it's even easier for me to keep working because my computer is right there. So. I can just go into my, my home office and continue working instead of leaving the office and coming home and it's separate. So if you work from home, that's really tricky, but you really need to make sure that you are avoiding the temptation to constantly get back onto the computer and work during family time. Um, creating a dedicated workspace, and I think that this is important. Um, even if you're not working from home, just having an area where you can keep things kind of organized that happen to be your work stuff. So if you have some you know, specific tools or some things you have to take with you, let's say you were working in construction, you have a hard hat and you have some other equipment or whatever, making sure you just have it and there's an, a dedicated space that's like, it just, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be more efficient if you have that dedicated space. And then certainly if you are 
working from home, having a space that's kind of your workspace and that um, others know and you set boundaries to make sure you can't be on my work computer, you can't be messing with my papers and, and, and set those boundaries because it's, it's sometimes very challenging. Um, delegating and sharing responsibilities. So this is also something very challenging when you are married and you, or even when you're not married and you have a, a former spouse that you're, you need to delegate responsibilities with and you have those shared responsibilities. I think a lot of moms don't get relief. They work all day and then they come home and they're expected to just go right back into the, the mom role and you know cook and clean and answer all the questions from the kids and do all this stuff. And um, it's because our society has kind of uh, trained us to be that way. So um, oftentimes the, the spouse, the husband, um, doesn't recognize that that's a real challenge for you. And so you've got to set those boundaries and let them know that once your workday is done and his workday is done, you need to have shared responsibilities. And you talk to each other and you say, what would you like to do? Well, I would like to do this. And, and you work things out. And maybe one week it flips, right? So you have similar responsibilities, but then you flip them the next week. And you have to find what works for you. But making sure, again, making sure you have clear communication of what those responsibilities are. And so your, your spouse may not even know that those are responsibilities that you have because it's been happening behind the scenes. And it's like magic. It's like, ah, oh, the house is all clean. This is so great. There's groceries in the in the in the fridge and in the cupboards. And it it in their minds, it is. It's sort of like magic. So you need to then say, I've got to have some help. And, and you have to speak up. You have to speak up for yourself because otherwise they they're really they really aren't aware of it most of the time. And we have to be better about in a perfect world, they would just they would just say, honey, you're now working. Let me take some of that responsibility from you but it's just not natural and they and it's very comfortable to keep doing what you've been doing so make sure you um you talk about those um making sure that you ask for help when you need it so don't let your feelings you know build up and you're just like so frustrated because they should have seen that you needed help they are they may not see it i know that sometimes i don't see things so give them the benefit of the doubt and just kindly say hey, when I come home, I really need some help. So when I see you and you're just watching TV or you're sitting on the couch on your phone and the kids are running around and trying to cook, can you please keep them happy? And, and, and at first it's not gonna be easy. They're not gonna be used to it. You're gonna have to remind them kindly, hey, remember we talked about this. I need you to help step up here and there. And then certainly on the weekends, they're gonna have to do some more, more help too. So if you normally did all the grocery shopping, they may have to, and you might have to train and help and be patient with them because it's new. It's new for them as well, but this will pay dividends. So make sure you do that. You're going to have to review and adjust regularly. Sometimes your work schedule will change. Sometimes things will get harder in one area, so you're going to need help in another area. So make sure you're flexible. Realize that it's not going to be set in stone, and sometimes you're just going to have to make changes based on what happens with your new job and how things are, are working out. Just making sure you're flexible will make a huge difference and um, that will help with your work life, um, your work and home balance. Okay, building a support network. Now this is not something I was very good at. I'm much better now, but I was not very good at it. And I don't think we often think to reach out to those other moms, other individuals who can actually be a really great support network to us. So, for example, our family and friends, um, in fact, I should move to the next slide. Family and friends, former colleagues, mentors, those can all be part of your support network. So think about those in your life that can be helped to you. So on the checklist for homework, that's one of the things I want you to make a list of family, friends, and former colleagues and mentors who could potentially be helpful to you. You don't know where, when you're going to need them. But if you have a list and you can go to it, and again, if I made my list, I put it in my binder and be like, okay, this is my go-to list. And for example, if there was some emergency, you could say to your family, um, go to my, you know, go to this page. I have a bunch of people on that page is this so-and-so's name and their phone number. Contact them. They're going to be able to help you. So that is something to have, you know, you're probably not going to need it, but just in case you need it. But also too, being able to just to talk to others who are in your same situation, which is why I put other working moms. Sometimes you just need somebody else to talk to and just say, hey, is this normal? 
Or are you having these struggles too? Or how do you delegate and manage responsibilities in the home? How do you do this? And just sharing that information will be so helpful. Don't, you know, don't try to do it all and figure it out all by yourself. Go to those other moms that are working that could also provide some support. Um, there's lots of different you know, mother support groups, networking groups, and things like that. Again, if you just Google it and you choose um, locations that are close by, then you can find them here locally. But there's also ones that are remote, so you can have a virtual meetup as well. Um, utilizing workplace resources, this can be really helpful too. So some organizations, some companies have additional resources through the human resources department. So HR can provide these resources, but you won't know about it unless you ask them about it or if you find out about it during orientation. So sometimes they have um, workplace allies, like when I worked at Amazon, they're um, making sure that there were allies to help the women in the workforce was very important. So we had a lot of male allies who could help support us. And that was super important to be able to have access to those male allies that could be helpful to us. Um, there's also different associations for um, networking and support that can also be found through your work as well. So make sure that you go through and take advantage of those if the HR offers them. Some, some companies and organizations don't. Um, smaller ones usually don't. Larger ones usually do. So we are now at the end of our evening and wanted to just go through the takeaways because I think this is important and um, I, you know, some of this you may already know, but I think it's going to be really, really helpful to realize that mom guilt is a normal part, part of motherhood. I think it goes hand in hand with being a mom. I, I don't know any mom who doesn't feel mom guilt at some point. And if you have solved it for yourself, please share it with me because I struggle with mom guilt and it's something I'm working on, but I've also embraced it in many ways because it makes me a better mom. So it's not the end of the world that I feel this mom guilt. Um, time management tools have to work for you and your needs. So what works for somebody else may not work for you, and that's okay. If you're not inclined to do the digital apps and all of those resources, that's, that's okay. You've got to find what works for you, and it may take a lot of time. It took me a lot of time to realize I need to just do all of my time management and organization in a binder. That took a long time for me to realize that. And I stumbled around you know different things and then I felt really disorganized and I felt like I wasn't on top of things and every time I kept going back to my paper lists and stuff that's when it worked for me boundaries are there to help everyone boundaries are good boundaries are can be very healthy and wonderful for your family it can prevent a lot of uncomfortable situations if you set up boundaries ahead of time and sometimes those boundaries have to be flexible and you don't even know what the boundaries are at first. You have to then figure it out and then say, okay, I know this is a boundary I've got to put in place. Let's talk about it. And always have really good communication about those boundaries. Your support network is like insurance. You don't you, you don't use it all the time until you absolutely need it, right? And sometimes you're just gonna rely on your mom friends who are working on a more regular basis. But Making sure that you have your support network in place for when you do need it is gonna be really important. And like I said, I didn't take advantage of it when I was um, you know, first starting out, and now I try to do that. So make sure you've got a support network. This is a quote by Sarah Blakely. She started Spanx, and she says, the struggle is real, the juggle is real. This is why everyone should hire working mothers. They are put in crazy situations all the time and are forced to problem solve. They are some of my most resourceful employees. We all know this. We all know that we have to juggle and manage so many responsibilities with our home. We are the best employees because we're gonna be asked to manage different projects and oh, and we've got this last minute thing and can you help do this? And yes, you can because you've been doing it your whole mothering career and so think of yourself as the best employee like go into the workforce and returning the workforce thinking I'm actually really I, I'm really good at this because you are you are really good at this and any of those time management multitasking you know you're running here and there and you've got to make sure that everything all the needs are met that is really valuable to any organization so recognize that you are very valuable and Guilt management, 
can be as important as time management for mothers. And this is Cheryl Sandberg, who for many years was the chief um, operating officer, I believe, for um, Facebook, now Meta. And she has had, obviously, this has been um, something she's had to deal with. And she is a, you know, an executive. And she still has the you know, guilt management. So making sure that you manage your guilt in a way that's healthy and productive try to let it go. I don't, I don't know what the answer is, um, but for me, it's just realizing that it exists and, and, and I own it and it's okay. It's not going to keep me from being a great mom. I'm going to be a great mom regardless, but um, the guilt is, is not a bad thing. Um, this is my family. And again, look, look, uh, I have my son-in-law in the middle that wasn't in this picture, but look, look how grown up they are now. And this is why I do what I do. I love my family. And having when I had to return to the workforce, it was not easy on them. My daughter, I had to ask her to help drive. And my, my son, they had to pick up kids from piano lessons. And there, when I was in, um, and when I was away at the office, because when I first returned to the workforce, I was not remote. I'm remote now. But I had to ask them to help. And they did. And they ended up becoming very close, right? Because they were kind of the pseudo mom and dad for many of the situations. And that again, like when you talk about delegating, delegating to your kids who are mature enough to be able to help, that is huge. My kids now have become really resourceful and dependable and responsible because they had to be, right? So think of when you return to the workforce, think of it as a gift. You are giving your children an opportunity to serve each other in a way they never would have either. And something else I did not mention is make sure you aren't paying them to do those things. Make sure that they understand that being helpful is part of being a member of the family. When you need them to drive their sibling or pick up or when you make their lunch or whatever it happens to be that you ask them to do, let them know that it's just part of being a member of the family. I do the, all these things because I'm a member of the family and you do some of those things too. So I really recommend that you don't incentivize them by paying them extra because there's some things that are just part of being the family. Certainly if you had them do something extra that was above and beyond, yeah, you could definitely reward them with something else. But get them comfortable with, with helping out and serving their, their siblings um, because it will bless them. And it's hard to believe that this was 10 years ago. This was 10 years ago. And look how far we've come. So I just want to let you know that I know you can do it. You have it in you. Whether you're returning to the workforce right now or it's going to be in a few years, it doesn't matter. You can do it. You can do anything. And in 2024, it's our year to be brave. So even if you're not returning to the workforce, you should be doing brave things because you're building muscles. And every time you do something that's hard and out of your comfort zone, you'll get stronger. You'll get braver. So when you are ready to return to the workforce, you'll be like, I did some hard things. I can do this. Being a mom is hard. I, yeah, that, that it's very, it, being a mom is very hard, but it's so rewarding. I love it. And I'm so grateful that I could have, I was able to be a stay at home mom for as long as I was. But um, being a working mom is also very rewarding and my kids have benefited from it. So we are at the end. Good luck.